Alright gang, so we've started a playthrough here of Von Manstein's Backhand Blow. Uh, what is this? T January, end of January, 43, into almost the end of March, 43. And of course, the one of Von Manstein's brilliant counterstrokes to quell the, the Soviet surge uh, when they started all their counteroffensives. Uh, we played through turn one. Let's just take a quick look at the map here. So I've marked all the victory lo victory this victory point locations for the Soviets, the cities. You got Belgorod, Kharkov. Uh, you got Stalino down there. Uh, what else we got? We got Poltava here. We've got. Don't even ask me to say it. Nepopetrovsk. Okay. Zaporizhzhia so down here in the corner, and of course, then you know you step losses. You get victory points for step losses and what side of the river they're on. Um, interesting concept of this game. I, I watched, uh, uh, I think it was Kev from Big Board Gaming. He did a couple videos where he started to play this, <clears throat> and it's, you've got the Voronish and the Southwest fronts. Okay, looks like a supply marker right here with twelve hex range. And then the southwest down here. Now, from what I've been reading, the objective was to for the southwest was to drive and take the crossings down here where these two victory locations are. Um, and the Voronish front was to they kind of bypassed Belgorod, from what I understand, and to encircle Kharkov and then take Kharkov back. Uh, of course, you know, they were just trying to spearhead through the German lines, and um, actually on the first turn, they caused a lot of casualties to the Germans, but the Germans fired right back at them. Interesting combat system. Uh, the charts and tables are really kind of unique to this game, too. Um, and then you've got these chip pulls that you do. So if you look at one of these units here, that red number in the middle, that's their... their um, tactical value. So he's a four. You've got twos and some fives. Okay. So whoever has the highest tactical value unit in the battle, that's how many of their special combat chits you draw. Let me pull a couple out here. So here's some German ones. So you pull these chits out and they're, they're numbered on the one side. They're numbered on the one side there so you can see what turns there in play. But you'll pull these chits out and depending on whether or not you have the advantage or you might get to use three of how many you draw, which you'll draw the same number as your highest tactical value unit. So this, if it was this unit here, he gets to draw four. And let's say he was being attacked by that Soviet tank army, or tank corps right there, he would get to draw five. Now, since the Soviet tank army would have the tactical value, he would get to keep three of his chits. And the German, since he would have the lower tactical value of four, he would only get to use keep one. So he would pull four, and then he would choose the best one of the bunch, okay? And he would apply that. So you've got things like uh, uh, the Soviet combat strength is cut in half. That's a good one, right? Or heavy tanks are involved. You've got some Tigers in there. So you might get a, you know, if you're defense, you'll get a minus one on, the, on their die roll, on the attacker's die roll. Or maybe you pull that one, and all the hits that your unit takes, they get cut in half. So if he takes two step losses, You'll only have to take one. And then there's another one right there, German minus one hit. All right, so you, you know, you'll get those with every combat and then you'll choose the ones you want to use. So solitaire system, I'm playing, since I'm playing it by myself, what I do is if, like if I pull four or five and I only get to use three, I'll roll a dice and then just, you know, I'll just have them laid out on the board and just count one, two, three. You know, if I roll a three, I'll take the third one, then I'll roll again. and. You know, if I roll six, I'll count through them until I hit number six, and then I'll pull that one. <clears throat> and that's, it's it's not allowing me to be sort of in command um, myself. And maybe not quite as realistic, but sure does make the game fun. <laughs> you don't know what you're going to draw, or you don't make the choice yourself. Now, granted, if you're playing against somebody or, uh, you know, they're not going to see the ones you pick. You're going to pick them, and they're going to pick them. 
and then you're going to flip them over. So, you know, it'll be, it'll be your choice. Um, okay. So these front markers, you have a, uh, the supply range from these things is 12. So those two units right there, that one, the broadest front marker and the Southwest front marker, um, in order to provide the action chits that you draw or supply, your, your combat units have to be within 12 hexes of those. All right, of one of those two. And uh, it's really not a problem near the beginning here, but I imagine as you spread out that it gets tougher. All right, the game works on these C3Is. Uh, I'm not even sure. I really should look at the book, see what that stands for. But what you do is you roll a dice and you'll, you'll have, you get so many of these C3I points a turn, which you'll see right here on the charts. Uh, the, uh, second, the, the red line is for the Soviets and the gray line is for the Germans. Um, and you'll, so you'll move your C3I up and then you'll pull out a, when it's your activation, you have, you can only use points. You use points to move, acti activity points to move and to do combat. So to move a unit for the Soviets, it is one activation point to move a unit, okay? For the Germans, it's the same too, but a division that's stacked together, or like, uh, what do we got here? Like if all three of these from the KG here were stacked together, the camp group here, they could move using one point, all right? A combat, no matter how many units is involved in an attack, cost you three points, so you don't get a mass of these activity points, but you roll on a chart. <clears throat> so let's say you have six C C3I points and you're starting the turn and it's your turn to, you know, it's your turn to start doing movement and combat. So you'll roll on the activity table and you'll determine how many points you're going to spend. So if you want to do a massive movement and combat, maybe of those six C3I points, you'll spend three and then you roll a dice and that'll give you your activity points. So then you set your activity markers, which are hidden. For the Soviets, it's those front markers. And for the Soviets, you have to divide them evenly between the two fronts. So if you get 15, you have to give one of them eight and the other one seven. You can't do like nine and six. And then you'll use those activity points to do your movement and do your combat. So in the game, each side is played in sort of like three, three phases when it comes to movement and combat. You have first Schwerpunkt for both Soviet and then the German. Then you have the second Schwerpunkt for the Soviet and the German. And then you have General for both the Soviet and the German. So during the Schwerpunkts, you have to use the activity points. All right. During the General ones, everybody gets to move or combat. So if a unit moves, he cannot conduct combat. All right. So it's either you're going to move or you're going to conduct combat. You're going to attack somebody from right where you were sitting without moving. So you got to keep, but, but that doesn't cost any activity points. You just, you get to do it. Okay. And that is the simple base of the game. Now you also have this thing called administrative movement, which I'm going to assume is like representing how these forces moved units along the rails. So during an administrative phase or during the sphere punks, you can, during the administrative phase of that, you can pick a unit up off the board, like let's say it was the Germans, and you can move him into the administrative movement box. And of course, then on the next, their next phase, he'll, you know, you can, all units that are in the movement box one can move over to movement, administrative movement box two. Then on the next phase, if you, you can bring one unit in from movement box two, to any valid location on the map, which it will be a hex that is adjacent to one of your friendlies or in a hex with one of your friendlies. And then of course it has to be in no enemy zones of control and it has to be in supply. Okay. Which supply is pretty simple for the Germans in this game. It's just a continuous path. Um, and like I say, you can pick one unit up off the map, only one and put it in the administrative movement box one. So one unit can go in, one unit can come out of two and back onto the map, and all units that are in one can be moved over to two. So they might just sit there for a while until you move them back in. Uh, of course, with the Germans, you know, when you have the division stacked together, they can all come in if, you know, as one unit. So keep that in mind. Uh, from what I've, I haven't got to it yet because I just started playing it, but uh, 
from what I've read in the designer's notes and stuff, it, that the use of the administrative movement in this game is, is, can determine whether you can, whether you win or lose or not. And I got to imagine with the Germans, that's probably a, a, a big thing for them. Um, what I do know about this, uh, the details of this, from what I've been reading, uh, like Library of Congress and uh, there was a, an American, I want to say he was a an OCS officer that wrote a paper or something while he was in college um, about this, this portion of the fight. <clears throat> and really just all I've been able to pick out of it right now is I know the second SS Panzer comes in and they defend along this river. It, it, they got in here and it kept the Soviets that broke through from actually attacking across that river, you know, at an earlier time. Um, I know that uh, some of the units will come up here from, I, I guess this is the south on the map. So the deal was is that von Manstein got permission to pull, get the troops that were out of the, the uh, on the other side of Rostov towards the Caucasus. He had to keep Rostov, which would have been down and off that way. So we had to keep it open long enough to pull, I think it was 1st Panzer Army back through there. 1st or 4th, I can't remember. But he did get them back through. And then he started to, with the Soviets, their, their, their offensive that they started, he started to build a force uh, in order to strike these offensives and give the Germans the momentum or the initiative again in the Eastern Front. Um, I haven't gotten really deep into the details yet. I mean, everybody pretty much knows the how the East Front went. You know, you start with Barbarossa, then you go to Case Blue, and then you go to Stalingrad. And everything turns around, and then the Soviets kick the Germans all the way back to Berlin and win the war. That's the basic story. <laughs> all right, so here's reinforcements over here. Uh, sorry about the light there. They come in on certain turns, certain locations. Um, your informational markers, very minimal in this game. You've got supply markers there. You've got uh, markers where you can list somebody when they, so that you don't, during a general turn, if you move a unit, uh, you can put a marker on them so that you don't use them in combat. Or if you combat with a unit, you put a marker on them so that you don't move in by accident. Um, there's your admin move markers. Uh, that's really it for informational stuff. Um, up here, you've got some charts. You've got, you've got the reinforcement schedule for the, for the Soviets and the Germans on these two sheets. Let me get this out of there. On the sheets here. You've got variable reinforcements. You've got replacements, which will start on game turn two with a dice roll. Uh, I don't I have to look that up. I can't remember how the, how that, I guess you just roll. Yeah, I have to look at the rules to see when you actually do that. Oh, uh, you've got your weather chart there on the card. Uh, weather's key in this game. All right. And you, of course you'll roll for weather. There's your victory point list. And I need some clarification on this because that, those two right there, the Soviet units west of the Donets and German units east of the Donets, and you check your victory, there's a victory point check phase in every turn. And if one of these team, if one of the, the sides meets the victory points thing, the game's over. Well, I got to find out some verification on that because I still had five units after the first turn, German units that were east of the Donuts. Well, that's what, 75 points minus? So that would have put, you know, there's, there's literally because they traded step losses equally there, the Soviets have no victory points. So at the end of that turn, the Germans would have had converted to a negative 75. Well, that would mean the game was over. Now I was amazed the number of German units I had to retreat back across the Donitz river in the first turn, but there's still some up North that are considered across. So I don't know. I can't see the game ending like that. That doesn't make any sense. All right, then you have breakdown units over here. So you got some units on the board that they have multiple steps they can lose. Well, these, you know, they, they'll they lose the first one on the board. After they lose the second one, they go to this these cards over here and get these units over here to replace them with, okay? Um, just additional administrative movement boxes in case you don't use the ones on the map. Ones on the map are fine, though. And then you got these force markers, and this reminds me of the great campaigns uh, of the American Civil War games where you can just put all the units over here and use the marker on the board when you have like a stack of units. I don't know, maybe that's, maybe you're supposed to hide these charts so your enemy can't see the strength in there. Uh, let's see, you got a random events table, uh, your activity table, Soviet uprising. If the Soviets get near within three hexes of one of these cities right here, 
in yellow that have that have these um, these static zap units or whatever they are, these garrisons, city garrisons, you know, probably what are they called, Isensots or something like that. Um, if the Soviets want a Soviet combat and you get within three hexes of one of those, you roll on this Soviet uprising table and it might flip that to like a Soviet uh, unit that's in there, it might turn their tables. There's a random events table. Haven't hit that yet. I'll st I think that starts here on the next turn. And your, there's your combat results table. You know, you'll notice it goes two to one, three to one, four to one, five to one. Then it goes to seven to one. Then it goes to 10 to one. Then it goes four to one. You'll use the highest one. So if you've got an eight to one tack, you'll use seven to one. Okay. And then it's left side is attacker step losses and right side is defender. All right. Uh, it's train effects chart. Very simple because most of the time it's frozen. All right. Or it's mud or it's deep mud. Okay. Attrition chart. Haven't had to use that one yet. Let's see it's on the other side. All right, we already did that. Um, sequence of play, nothing too hard about this. Okay. Like I said, you have an administrative phase. All right. Then you have your, your, your movement and combat phases. All right. First Soviet sphere punct, first German sphere punct, second Soviet sphere punct, second German sphere punct, Soviet general, German general, victory check segment, and then you start a new turn. So it really doesn't take that long. There's like, I said, there's not a ton of counters on the board. Um, like I say, you just got to pay attention to the use of your activity points in the initial stages. And then, of course, on the gen make sure you set yourself up so that in the general phase, you have your units in position to attack. And if not attack, you're, you know, ready to move. And the movement points in these, the movement allowances are not very big, especially for infantry. The motorized ones are like sevens and sixes. But most of the, the, foot walkers there they're just all two so you're not going very far and of course frozen terrain you just walk right across those rivers like they were not even there all right and uh that's the basis of the game i mean so you know my intention is to work as the soviets work on belgorod and karkov over here um they get a massive reinforcements i think well the germans do on turn three and the soviets get a nice burst on turn five they start to get some of these guards units and their their armor cores are large compared to the germans so they're gonna have to, you know need to try to break out uh maybe knock down a whole lot of step losses before uh von manstein sneaks in hopefully he doesn't uh you know for the soviet sake he doesn't sneak in behind him and, and you know pinch them and you know sort of cut them out of supply or to just sort of roll them up i i don't know because i'm i didn't bother to look at where they come in at. I'll just pull them in as the turns go and then let the game develop from there. That's the, that's the fun part about playing games where, yeah, you might know the history of what went on, but you don't know the real details or where troops came in from. Um, I, I like As much as I like to read about the stuff, I think it's a lot more fun to play a game without doing that, reading those, those real, real... In, <laughs> tiny details about how somebody, where they arrived, what road they chose to come in on and how they approached. So we're going to get on with this. Actually, that's the end of the first turn. We'll keep you updated. Hopefully we'll shoot one of these with each turn to see how this develops. But here's the overall picture right now. The Southwest front down here, uh, they smacked these units here near the river. They have no activity over there yet. All right. Um, then you move up to the, to the middle between the, the Southwest and the Varanish and then the Vranish front, and they're pushing. I've already pulled the Germans back because they've already taken, here's your losses right here. They've already, I mean, that whole pretty much, you know, what, there are three regiments right there from the 320th. They're smoked, or they're gone. I mean, that's, you know. And of course there's some Soviet, Soviet units too. An arm, there you go, that's half of an armor, an armor core, tank core. The other half of it's up on the board under that infantry regiment right there, so. And then they got a lot of step losses on the board. All right, so we're going to keep pushing with the Soviets and see how this develops. And uh, we'll get back to you after turn two. All right, thanks for watching.